Hey everyone, welcome to the Foresight Daily Sanity Preserver. We are now in the fourth week, uh, which is uh, kind of insane. Um, I, uh, I definitely did not expect uh, this to be such a successful uh, experiment and, um, and you know, it still really feels like we're just getting started. Um, I am very thrilled to have Samo Bucha here today. Samo was actually, uh, I think, my favorite talk at one of my first Effective Altruism Global uh, conferences that I went to um, five, five years ago, I think. Um, and I think it was on the hidden value uh, of institutions. Uh, and it, it was really quite mind boggling. I still have it, uh, I still have it um, uh, quite engraved, uh, um, quite engraved and, and, and very present with me. So uh, uh, since then I've been kind of tracking him and then, you know, I got the chance to collaborate a little closer with him. Um, We've had him, I think, for I mean, really, uh, quite quite a, a variety of different uh, foresight gatherings for anything from private, uh, where it's mostly about the governance of AI, uh, to public meetings uh, and salons. So it's been really nice to uh, kind of like continuously catch up with you, Samo. Um, and then very recently, um, and you know, to to my great um, uh, to to my great pleasure, uh, we now have you as a senior fellow. Uh, at the Foresight Institute as well. So it's a really, really nice to kind of like um, to um, to be more interwoven uh, with your work. Uh, so I welcome you uh, to today's salon. I'm going to post a more lengthy bio of you in the chat room. Um, and uh, you're going to today be talking about how bureaucracies uh, respond to failure, which is quite a timely talk, I think. Um, um, and yeah, uh, you are leading a consultancy called Bismarck Analysis, which uh, takes a quite unique uh, um, perspective on consulting companies um, using really history and um, uh, and a lot of, uh, I think, like political theory and, and, uh, and trying to zoom out of the immediate uh, kind of like idiosyncrasies in which the institution uh, is entangled in to kind of like uh, take a broader look at um, at the possibilities uh, and at the ecosystem in which the uh, in which those institutions or in which those companies exist, and uh, try to make sense uh, of them from from this rather uh, longer lens. Uh, this is a, quite a unique approach, I think. Currently, uh, even though historically it has been uh, much more widespread uh, and, and and much better practiced, uh, so it's 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 kind of a it's kind of a, a really kind of like uh, deep. Uh, deep and at the same time zoomed out perspective on and how our world functions. So I can't uh, I can't um, wait for what you uh, for how you cast this lens uh, onto the current crisis, uh, and I'm uh, I'm excited for what you're going to share with us. I'm hoping for this to be quite uh, an open uh, an open discussion, and you know I'm hoping that we definitely today tackle the higher hanging fruit of trying to see how we can uh, spawn larger uh, greater change from the current COVID nineteen crisis. Um, so with that being said, take it away, Samo. I'm very thrilled to have you. Uh, my name is Samo Burya. I'm the founder of Bismarck Analysis. I've also thought for a very long time over the last 10 years about how institutions work. I have an interest in civilizations, how they, you know, rise and fall, and also institutions, what the origin is of institutions, what's the origin of social technologies, um, what is the, uh, what is the, main driver behind institutional transformations. So some of you already heard and some of you just joined the chat room. I opened with a you know introduction for today's topic. It is how bureaucracies handle crisis. Now, crisis is particularly timely because of the COVID pandemic, right? We are all uh, seeing the world and we're seeing countries and companies and individuals and organizations respond to it in different ways. Uh, different societies take different measures, different organizations either had foresight or lacked foresight. Um, there's disagreements as to the, you know, biology uh, of this, you know, threat. And I think that it is a great illustration of crisis of bureaucracy because the crisis of bureaucracy always comes with a failure uh, of processing information. Now, let's talk about crisis and normalcy. You might have a catastrophic event that is a crisis of an institution, or you might have a protracted period of failure where the normal everyday operation of it is completely disconnected uh, from relevant realities when it's operating outside of context. Um, a good, I think a good example of this might be taxation in the late Roman Empire, where the paperwork 
is filed for how much uh, income is supposed to come from various provinces. There are legal disputes resolved in those provinces. And then some of the provinces in question are already de facto governed by barbarians. So the, in theory, in legal reality, back in Rome, we're expecting yay much taxation. We're expecting this or that governor to be put into office. But in practice, say, you know, the Franks or the Langobards or the Vandals or whatever, uh, you know, sub-tribe is already governing the area much more so than any sort of Rome-appointed governor or any senatorial elite from, from Rome. Now, this sort of long-term failure can go on for years, for decades at a time before the final legal break is made, right? So there's a, a legal fiction that is enforced that of a unitary Western Roman Empire, but an on the ground reality of essentially local management by tribes uh, and tribal structures that had moved in with permission of Rome. And the real, you know, the real interesting part of that isn't so much the movement of peoples, but almost the movement of legal systems. Uh, the, this sort of persistent long-term failure to understand reality often ends up being overcome in these kind of cool-like situations where the breakup of the Soviet Union in the 1980s is an interesting example. Uh, there exists a Soviet central government. The Soviet central government uh, proposes that it's in control of the situation and understands the situation. Yet its failure to process information about the world first became apparent with the Chernobyl crisis, right? In the Chernobyl crisis, this was, again, a disaster. It wasn't a failure of everyday operation, but it was an unusual event, right? Perhaps, you know, downstream of some of the failures of the management of Soviet power plants. But I think even more importantly, in a failure of the Soviet system, right? Chernobyl in particular happens because a lot of the fictions that are needed uh, you know, to pretend that the Soviet economic system is working well in 1980 or 1982 or 1985 rest in pretending that people are doing their job. If we are pretending people are doing their job, then we can claim that there's this vast functioning economic apparatus, that these companies are going to meet their targets eventually, that there's some difficulties in administration, but eventually the situation will normalize. If, on the other hand, we expect and demand, no, this particular person has to do not the fake version, not the paper version, but the real version of the maintenance work or the scientific work or the experimental work that they need to do. Well, to distinguish between what's real and fake would reveal most of the system is already fake. That's politically unacceptable. But from the, from the perspective of uh, physics, right, from the perspective of whether the nuclear reactor will be well managed through what was an experimental run, right? So Chernobyl was undergoing an experimental run of the reactor to see how it operates when you push it beyond design specifications. So to do that well, well, you very much need every single person in that factory doing their job pretty much explicitly as it should be described as is written on paper. And I think, you know, Soviet work culture just was not there. Uh, the professional incentives and the personal incentives pushed against doing your very best work. But once the crisis was underway, you know, once it was understood that a physical failure of the everyday normal system had occurred, a lot of these people out of altruistic motivation stepped right back in and within the broken bureaucratic structure, both within the power plant itself, the local authorities and the Soviet authorities at the highest level, they try to do the right thing. So the dynamic that happens here is there is a normalcy where the uh, bureaucracy is representing a fake reality. There is a crisis that happens because assumptions made on the basis of a fake reality are not borne out by physical reality. So the paper trail is not realistic. On paper, you know, the governor of Gaul has supreme power in Gaul. In practice, it's a Frankish warlord that has supreme power in Gaul. So that's a disconnect between the paper reality and the actual underground reality. Um, on paper, you know, Chernobyl's uh, experts are their morale is high. They're showing up to work. They're not drunk on work. Uh, the managers of Chernobyl are honest about the, you know, the resources the plant has available. Um, the uh, electricity gains and the efficiency gains 
that are pr promoted by the people running the experiment are going to allow the Soviet Union to meet its five-year plan in energy, right? So in a way, the Chernobyl experiment is an experiment that's not allowed to fail. You're not supposed to say, this is too risky an experiment, even if it improves efficiency, and even if it were to allow us to simplify the operation of a nuclear power plant, because saying this would get in the way of a manager one level up, would get away in the way of a manager one level up above that, who has to, with a straight face, say the Soviet Union is going to meet its energy targets. So the inability to say the Soviet Union will not meet its energy targets, following down to well, we are just having difficulty getting excellent people following down to, well, this is too risky an experiment to run because we don't have the staff and technical capacity to run it well. And even if it works well, we couldn't possibly translate this into the kind of economic gains that are expected of us. That would be a functional bureaucratic process, right? One where the information would manage to flow upward. A lot of people would say that it's impossible for information to flow from the bottom, bottom all the way to the top but we see very complicated projects undertaken and successfully executed. A good example of this is, you know, the D-Day landings, right? We might disagree about how well or poorly the D-Day landings were carried out by the Allied forces during World War II, but we can't really deny that, you know, tens of thousands of pieces of hardware were delivered on, you know, you know the North Atlantic beach. And this is much more impressive than Amazon Prime, if you think about it. Amazon Prime, you know, I certainly am not going to try to stop an Amazon Prime delivery. There certainly was an attempt by the Germans to stop, you know, the physical delivery of American hardware, of American soldiers, of British soldiers, of Australian soldiers, and so on, and the supply lines for them, right? This is an, almost as an adversarial environment, very, very, uh, very difficult, yet it happened. So anyone who says that, you know, bureaucracies can never achieve the kind of flow of up, you know, uh, bottom to top information and top to bottom decision making that would allow them to perform such feats is wrong because the army was such a bureaucracy at the time. This doesn't mean we should apply this technology everywhere. And it certainly doesn't mean it can't catastrophically fail as it did in the Soviet Chernobyl example or uh, as it did in the like, you know, security and tax collection example of the late Roman Empire. Um, but you have to, you have to account for that possibility, right? You have to acknowledge that, okay, it is an inherent possibility of the system. It is there. Is this possibility actualized? And the difference between a crisis that is, you know, a mere three mile island and a crisis that is a Chernobyl is often not in the technical specifications of whatever problem you're dealing with, or even, you know, how severe the tornado or hurricane that lands on your shore is, because, you know, that disaster might be natural in character, right? It's certainly not the fault of the emperor of China if there are heavy rains, but the emperors of China were routinely considered illegitimate if the aftermath of the flooding in major cities was disastrous and if relief efforts were not carried out. Um, so in a very strong sense, there's like, you know, there's a test of capacity that happens whenever a event that is perhaps less likely, but eventually will always come back, will always happen, uh, shows up. So in, in, this, in this space, I think this is supposed to be more of a, of a salon rather than just a you know direct talk i'm happy to continue now with the talk but i think what i wanted to sketch out here is that uh, the bureaucratic fictions that are needed to preserve the legitimacy of an institution if maintaining them requires to ignore physical facts physical facts will be ignored physical facts can be ignored somewhat because there's a buffer but there will be outlier events either man-made or natural where the physical facts become impossible to ignore and then even though all the individuals in the bureaucratic chain might suddenly realize that far more is at stake than just their career or their immediate incentives and try their very best often up to heroic efforts, right? Again, by heroic efforts, I mean uh, the work of a lot of the people trying to contain the, so, contain the radiation uh, in you know, the Chernobyl reactor. A lot of those people understood that they would die Right, and some of them just still went on and did their job. They tried to do their best. So this, uh, 
This means that despite such heroic efforts, you are still stuck coordinating with the exact same system that failed you. So once physical reality for everyone involved pierces the bureaucratic reality, you are still stuck using your old bureaucratic system unless something different was built. And uh, now let me check whether there are any intermediate questions. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, Allison, Allison, can you hear me? Rachel I don't know how... has one. She said one, one sec. I have a few. Am I, is it okay to turn my mic on? Yes. Is that, is that all I right? I can hear you. I can even smell. And Rachel had her first question. Yeah, no, I had, I had a few, but I'll, I'll try to focus. I mean, one big question I have because you studied this is how do you go about interrogating our bureaucratic institutions effectively to find out, you know, are they hiding facts? What are the incentive structures? What's being incentivized? Um, it's something that seems that you have a lot of expertise in. I know I think a lot about what kinds of minds, what kinds of people gravitate towards an institution, how that shapes behavior. Um, so you can share more about how you learn these things uh, mm. and that really valuable. Okay. Uh, I think with bureaucracies, often you can't go, you can't skip the step of just reading the documentation. So this is one reason why it's like perhaps easier to study, you know, long destroyed bureaucracies than live ones. If you say wanted to understand um, an intelligence agency, you might have a better time trying to understand, say, the functioning of the Yugoslav intelligence agency in 1970 to 1980 than, say, trying to understand, you know, the functioning of British or American or Soviet intelligence because it's long defunct, right? It's not guarding its archives. It's not guarding its secrets. Um, likewise, you know, something that's so old that it seems almost irrelevant. If no one needs uh, something to be true about a company's history to save their job, they don't really mind if you go through their stuff. Um, an example of the kind of research work that I've done over the years, both myself and with various research teams might be uh, I dug at one point into uh, published archives of uh, the Nixon administration, including visits to the Yorba Linda Presidential Library in Southern California to try to figure out whether the uh, macroeconomics team working for the Nixon administration was actually listened to and was actually formulating policy. The result was they were not formulating policy. They were mostly receiving memos from Nixon saying, you know, uh, we've decided to do, we've decided to implement this or that economic measure, uh, find a justification for why it's good for the economy. And I very much see little reason to believe macroeconomics expertise has much departed in its actual rather than its fictional role over the last 50 years in, in the US, right? So when we hear about, you know, economic advisors to the president and so on, I think it's important to keep in mind those, those incentives there and looking at examples of the paper trail and the communication trail left behind by these organizations. Now in the Roman example, uh, there we're stuck with very fragmentary evidence, uh, but we do have some evidence, right? We have various legal documents. We have uh, the letters that are written between people at the time. And we also have the physical reality of uh, army movements, right? Because armies leave traces. So we can infer, well, okay, on paper, it says the security here, is completely guaranteed and that you know the sources we do have say that the army is there but the uh, all the local artifacts seem to be say of uh, this or that germanic army rather than a, a more standardly equipped roman legion in that case i think it's like a straightforward conclusion that you're just rebranding mercenaries as if they're just straight up roman forces when they're not because straight up roman control implies that these are legions that are loyal to the empire rather than forces that perhaps for now aligned with the empire uh, might diverge from it at a whim or when material incentives change. I, did that, did that manage to answer your question? It's a yeah, very difficult question, but a very good one. No, that, that's really helpful. I think it's really helpful for understanding, especially when you're looking at historic methods. Um, I can see, how I can tack that on to, you know, when I'm trying to dissect what the incident structure might look like at the WHO right now. Right, right. Like the WHO is, is um, you know, I always find it a very interesting question to what extent it is the financial or the non-financial incentives that drive people. I think if you look at the WHO, it's the United States is the primary supporter of the organization, uh, but they seem to have gone out of their way to uh, be amenable to China. So perhaps what I would look at if I were investigating that, um, I would be looking into uh, the details of the careers of a bunch of the key decision makers 
and I would note whether they have entangling interests or vehicles from China. I would also check whether there were uh, decisions made for large WHO projects that are unrelated to the COVID crisis that the bureaucracy of the organization committed to years ago. So perhaps the leverage is, you know, work with us on this crisis. You need us anyway to handle this well. We know the most about what's happening in this virus. Um, or all of these collaborations we've had lined up and we've been working on, we just won't. And maybe we'll create our own WHO, right? Like that's, that's, that's real leverage right there. Um, I will, I think I want to take like two or three more questions and then I can talk through how once people understand there is a crisis, once people are stuck coordinating through a failed mechanism, how can this, this mechanism either rebound or how it collapses? Because that's, that's sort of like uh, part two of this. Okay, Josh, I think you're next. Hi. Um, there's a company in Ljubljana, Slovenia. Uh, they make security banknotes. Um, and I have a few of them. And um, we're trying to figure out how to introduce them to Rome um, as an alternate or tourist currency. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> I've never, I've never heard of this, uh, this product. I mean, it certainly makes for a good novelty. <laughs> I'm um, not sure whether, uh, well, the tie into the main topic could be something like, I think you would have an easier time introducing it as an alternate currency if the euro was a failed currency. Let me put it that way. And I think the euro is not yet a failed currency. Yeah, perhaps perhaps one can disagree about that. Um, assume, assuming I've answered the question, Ali. Uh, Ali, I think you had a question as well. Hi, I was trying to mute myself. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Fantastic. Let me see if I can also on. Um, there we go. Start start video. Oh, okay. There you go. Uh, proper mood lighting. Uh, so. Um, I think it's safe to say that the current response to the COVID-19 crisis has been bungled pretty well in the United States. And I was wondering if you had some thoughts on the institutional uh, uh, bureaucratic failures that have led to this and what in the future could mitigate that? What are some uh, features of the current bureaucracy that would lend to this happening again? Well, okay, I have to say again, the physical facts of the matter are in fact, you know, the physical facts aren't, aren't completely clear. We don't yet know enough about the biology of the virus, at least last I checked and last I looked into this, we don't. So we only have a limited ability to uh, compare the optimal response to the responses we actually have seen. Uh, I think that in the case of the Chernobyl disaster, the physics is really, really clear and was very, very clear even at the time when the organizations were acting. So all the organizations and the individuals were over the last four months uh, acting from this kind of position of ignorance, right, where they are exploring, right, they're undertaking exploration. Um, I think that we can learn best by comparing them to each other then, where rather than comparing to an ideal response, which we might think we have, but I think is actually a fairly sketchy assertion. I think it's a questionable assertion to think that it's very easy to figure out what the exact right approach is because we still, again, don't know too much about the details of which circumstances the virus spreads in. There are strong arguments to be made for relatively light touch and for relatively heavy handed measures. Uh, we can, however, compare different countries and their responses. So that's a big caveat on what was only a tiny part of your question, I think, but the caveat is necessary. Um, I think it's very easy to just, you know, to, to complain. I think that the way to handle this better next time would be an expectation that the partners, the governments around the world that are working with the WHO, are 
taking in WHO recommendations, both privately and publicly, to remove the constraint and the strange sort of feet dragging that we've seen where there was an attempt to, I think, essentially lie to the public. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to euphemize this, but there was an attempt to lie to the public that masks don't work and doctors need them. Now, again, there's always a positive role for propaganda, especially truthful propaganda. That's what public health campaigns always are. They're always propaganda. The anti-smoking campaign was propaganda, but they should be truthful. And this was uh, a statement that was not bought. I think on the margin, it didn't reduce demand for masks, uh, but it definitely confused several governments, right? Several governments straightforwardly gave uh, and acted, not just gave as if they were in on the joke that the WHO or say the CDC on the American side were into or the Surgeon General, but they acted as if, okay, the masks actually don't help, right? So this, this first off, there was a miscommunication there. Mm -hmm. um, so perhaps maybe the WHO should be less public facing, right? Maybe it should not be there making these big public pronouncements, but should have a more straightforward route to some of those institutions. The second one is, uh, why in the world would, do we think the WHO has good incentives to take care of this stuff anyway? Like I struggle to think of a good reason that they would invest a lot of career energy except pure idealism, right? And pure idealism note often is strongly selected against in a bureaucracy uh, to ensure that you know, global pandemics aren't an issue. Uh, you know, I think that the CDC plausibly had a better one but I think almost no one is noticing that the CDC and the FDA both failed their core mandate and I expect political consequences for both of these organizations to be minimal. So uh, a mechanism or a method or a principle has to be constructed through which the WHO has a direct interest in preventing global pandemics rather than an indirect interest in pleasing the national governments while retaining their ability to communicate directly to them. And I think that's a very difficult problem. That's basically the problem of international organizations. I think it's an unsolved problem. Uh, right. did, I, did I manage to answer your question here? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's a big question. So I appreciate uh, uh, that you addressed that and, and hadn't thought of the WHO thing, but yes, you're right. The, the incentives may not be entirely aligned. Interesting, interesting. Um, okay, um, yes, I'll try to stick to the smaller questions, though perhaps, again, I'm, I'm not an expert in currency, so. Um, wh who is the, who's next in line, Allison? I'm due to um, read a question for Michael McKenna at Allison's Thank you. request. And so Michael McKenna says, COVID-19 is unlike heavy rains in that one is self-evident from the photos and the other can be ignored by failing to roll out testing. Russia seems to be pretty willing to ignore the COVID-19 pandemic. To what degree is a pandemic a physical fact? I think the hospitals uh, and the hospitals being overwhelmed is undeniable once that happens, no? Unless you tell people to not go to the hospital and they die at home. You could hide people dying at home. Um, you can in fact even like high statistics and causes of death there. Uh, so I think that it is a physical fact once everyone knows a family member that has died. I think that's the level of pandemic. Say the Black Death is undeniable because it's mass death, right? The plague was undeniable no matter what people said, even in a time before audio video recordings. For now, fortunately, uh, the COVID crisis is not so straightforwardly a physical fact and arguably once it is, it's far too late. So the test is I still think in the future, I still think it's not completely clear that our institutions deeply failed on all levels. I think it's clear they made several mistakes just taking them at their word and that some institutions responded innovatively and others did not. Um, you know, it's just, this is a tangent on the question, but I am gonna say, you know, contact tracing. We tend to think of Western governments as creative. Now, whether we think contact tracing is a good idea or not, that was innovation by East Asian governments. And Western governments have shown very little innovation right now. Um, it could be because no innovation is necessary or it could be because they're incapable of innovation. So um, I, I hope that the, before the tangent, that, that part addresses the question, the question of physical fact 
you know, you can always ignore rumors of a flood in a town uh, many hundreds of miles away or a metropolis many hundreds of miles away. It's always like a sliding scale. In a way, radiation is not visible until your hair falls out, until your teeth fall out. Can I ask a question or are you reading, reading them? I was just, yeah. I was just catching up to the chat. It's really hard for me to like both read and talk, but yeah, okay. please, please do. Yeah. So a couple of things. So uh, the first one before you said the, your, this nonsense about the West being incapable of innovation. I wasn't saying it's incapable of innovation. Oh. I was just pointing that it has not yet shown innovation in this particular crisis. Oh, well, you obviously aren't tracking what's going on in vaccine development, which is understandable, but I mean, most of that is happening okay. in the West, okay? And most of it always has happened in the West, although True. that sort of leads into my contrary position, which might seem like it almost contradicts what I just said, although perhaps it does not, which is I, I, I agree with most of what you said up to this point about the in, incentives, especially of these various organizations. Um, and I'm not sure if it's a, a cause and effect or just a feedback loop, but I think there's another problem, which is we have a competence problem in some of these organizations. I mean, the people who get promoted to the top are not necessarily the right people. They're not promoted because they've done good work or they're even, um, I mean, they get promoted because they're good at politicking or they're uh, polit you know, they're, they're appointed for political reasons to appease certain groups or to make th things look balanced. Um, or, you know, uh, I'm not even sure why, but one thing I can tell you is from what I know from some of these communities where I'm familiar with in science and engineering, uh, it is certainly not often, the, it is like, it is rarely the case that the best people get the top jobs. Um, you know, I mean, sometimes it's because the best people are too busy working in the lab and not busy enough putting on fancy suits and, um, and going to uh, cocktail parties, right? So I'm not sure what, why it is, but what we're seeing now is the result of this problem. What we're seeing now is that our top agencies, both worldwide and in the U.S., um, a lot of times have, uh, I wouldn't say incompetent people at the helm, but not the best people. And so wanted to know your comments on that. That's, that's true. It's true both for private and public organizations though. Like a lot of the companies have, a lot of the older Fortune 100 and 500 companies have a similar problem. I think this is always a problem with um, institutions. After a while, they can fail the succession problem. I would say that for a lot of these organizations, you know, at least a lot of the functional organizations, when it's created, it has to work at least somewhat. Maybe it's still a bad idea to make something, you know, perhaps, you know, creating a very well-functioning army is not the greatest contribution to mankind, but it certainly requires a high level of competence. But no matter how competent the founding, um, you know, if the succession mechanisms are gamed over time, I do think, yeah, um, careerism beats sort of selection for competence, right? Like you can't just print meritocracy on the label of something and have it actually be meritocratic. If that's the way it works, then we would never need the concept of meritocracy, right? The term aristocracy when coined by Aristotle, which you look at the definition as basically supposed to be what today we think of aristocracy, but it over you time became such a parody. Yeah, meritocracy, right? Right, right? Aristocracy means ruled by the best. Meritocracy means almost the same or the most suited or the most competent. But uh, a system might call itself meritocratic even when it's anti-meritocratic. And that's why the word gets so distorted over time that you just need to introduce a new word to say, no, I don't mean that. So that's why uh, I would usually, I usually think that, you know, a lot of people might say, well, okay, then we just need to give them better SAT tests or something. They just need to be smarter careerists. And I think that doesn't really solve the problem, right? Because someone can be very, very intelligent and very disaligned or very intelligent and just not have the right expertise. And I think one of the big things that's been happening with expertise culture in the West is something that is not really captured by both neither left nor right critiques of this. It's the phenomena of very intelligent people who are narrowly specialized and relatively socially motivated in a narrow circle of their peers and friends to show off that are claiming mandates that exceed their actual competencies. 
there. So I would say that, you know, if we look at the people at the top of these organizations like the WHO or the CDC or the FDA, I, I wouldn't say the same thing about congressmen or presidents, by the way. I, I don't think, I think often they're more figureheads and they're, they're often not that competent. But uh, if you look at the layer of their, you know, chief of staff, say, I'm going to claim the chief of staff of literally every single congressman is probably a highly competent person, but they might be a highly misapplied competent person, right? Like their competence might be, again, like you said, you know, it might be a cocktail party or uh, it might be in media work, right? It, it's, um, it's been an interesting problem where in Italy, there were, uh, you know, there was a very successful politician who was a comedian, a stand-up comedian. Now, stand-up comedian certainly has competence, but should they be running for office? Probably no. And probably the fact that they're running for office shows that the citizenry was, was, was quite unhappy with those outcomes already. So I think both public popularity competitions and uh, sort of careerist, PhD, SAT style uh, selection mechanisms, I think both of these have been gamed significantly. And gaming them requires a skill, but it's not the skill that's usually needed for the job. I'm, I'm curious if you have a, a further response to this, I'd love to hear it. Well, I'm just wondering what, uh, what, what are there any remedies or are there, is there anything that works? Uh, I was thinking um, some organizations um, elect their own leadership. I mean, professional societies. And mm -hmm. I think then they really, a lot of times do tend to pick people who have distinguished careers that have made a lot of contributions and that also are good communicators or they probably wouldn't win the popularity side of the contest. Um, I don't know if the WHO and CDC do it that way. I have a feeling they're probably appointees, but I'm not sure about that. I think, uh, I think the way to, I think a remedy here um, is the remedy of shaking up the game every now and then, because otherwise good hearts law gets in the way. So when you first set up a civil service exam or something like a civil service exam, people don't know how to game it. So often what you do get is relatively competent outsiders who you know, actually know their business. Or you get people who have uh, you know, these careers that are not faked, they're not studying for the test, right? And they get in on the basis of their past contributions. Over time, people notice uh, what gets you into the position and they optimize directly for appearances rather than the substance. So when you hear today about say, um, you know, high schoolers choreographing their extracurricular activities to be accepted into Harvard, right? Sure. That is an example of that. When they first started looking at the extracurricular activities, you know, that might've been a good fit, right? But now it's clearly diverged from that good fit and has gone into the domain of like, this is performative. Um, and I think for contributions in the field, uh, I think for epidemiology, I'm, I'm, you know, it's, I think some fields are healthier and some fields are less healthy. I think, for example, in nutrition science right now, it would be very difficult to talk about like who has a good track record of achievement or not, right? I think in physics, it's probably a little bit easier, like notably easier. I'm, I'm downplaying it when I'm speaking. Uh, but I also think that a lot of the you know, question of who exactly gets their name on say the Nobel prize still does come down to a little bit like a popularity contest. So it's not that the Nobel prize necessarily goes to the absolutely highest achieving person, so the Nobel in physics, but a high achieving person that is working at the right team in the like, right sort of environment that the committee wants to emphasize that way, where it's almost wants to illuminate a new area of physics rather than illuminate an individual, which is one of the reasons they've had these like group prizes have become more and more common over the last 20 to 30 years of the Nobel. Um, and I think it's, it can be very difficult to judge achievements. Like, I don't think I'm very fit to judge the details of the biology of the virus. That's why I put huge caveats at the start, right? And I also think that most people are not fit to judge the, you know, expertise and achievements of someone that claims to, you know, just be a great doctor or an excellent biologist. It's like very difficult. You have to like look into it. And um, I think resetting some of the bureaucratic tests for the sake of resetting some of the bureaucratic tests and changing the conditions to entry, 
even if you just shake them up, as long as it's some sort of basic common sense argument that this selection mechanism is better than nothing, would for the next 10 or 20 years produce improved results. I'd, and, like, to, uh, I'd, like, to, I'd like to just say one thing, a small anecdote, which I think is relevant to this, although it's probably unrealistic to, susp to th think it would be applied at these high level positions for these uh, really um, uh, visible organizations. But I was a US uh, federal civil servant for most of my career. And when I joined the civil service, I was at NASA, as you can tell by the shirt. Um, anyway, uh, we uh, had to go through all this training for ethics training. And I think this, I think mm -hmm. ethic, actually ethical behavior has something to do with what we're talking about here. Um, and it's certainly something one can learn to a greater extent. I think people underestimate the value of, um, of learning there and possibly from mistakes or from example. So what I just wanted to say was that when we, when we had our ethics training, um, uh, one of the things, in fact, the main thing I remember from that training, which they basically, uh, well, anyway, the main thing I remember is that you were not only legally bound to avoid any financial conflicts of interest when you worked for the government, um, you had to, you were legally bound to avoid the appearance of any financial conflicts of interest. So even if by the letter of the law, what you were doing was not a conflict of interest, if it looked to a reasonable person like it could, was a conflict of interest, you were prohibited from engaging in it. And so that seems to me to be something that also could possibly be applied to these organizations because if we're worried about ulterior motives and bad incentives and, you know, uh, you know, going along with government officials who are, you know, contributing money and stuff like that, even if you know it's wrong, Again, it's a thing like, even if it's technically not a conflict of interest, it appears when that World Health Organization guy totally waffled and pretend he couldn't hear the reporter when she was asking him about Taiwan, you know, that appeared like a conflict of interest, even if it wasn't. And so perhaps we should be a little more insistent that our public officials and our public organizations don't even appear to have a conflict of interest. Well, but, but again, I think we're relatively easy to fool. They can achieve that just as easily by pressuring the Hong Kong journalist to not publish the video of waffling on the Taiwan question. Unfortunately, like some, some governments are really good at that, like much better than we, we would like. But I think it is, uh, there's some substance to what you say where the common sense test and the common sense answer is sometimes much harder to gain than a sort of long checklist of requirements, right? Like otherwise, like, you know, there's a lot of stuff that passes the smell test of lawyers that does not pass the smell test of common sense ethics. And it's, I think, the common sense ethics that's right, even though the legal requirements are allegedly so much more stringent. I think our complex, you know, I think our sense of common sense and what looks like an appearance of, con um, of conflict and so on, what is a conflict of interest, it's actually super sophisticated. We just aren't aware of it because we're fish in water. We have this like, you know, wonderful social brain that's fairly good at sussing some things out. Uh, thank you, Karan. Like, I really enjoyed this 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 part of the conversation. Okay, um, I mean, maybe go to David now. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, <clears throat> and that was very interesting, uh, Karan and Samo. So I'm I have a whole bunch of other questions, but I think uh, Rachel, if that's how it's pronounced, I'll I'll speak for her and and use this little slot uh, to say. Um, uh, to pose to you, what do you believe, uh, maybe about social theory or maybe about your specific study of social, of, of, of different bureaucracies? What do you believe that few others believe? Mm -hmm. And what principles have you learned in your studies that you really wish people were more aware of? Those are big questions. I'll try to narrow them as, you know, zoom in as directly as I can. Um, I think what I believe that few others believe is that the vast majority of human knowledge is very difficult to measure and very difficult to operationalize. I'm making a distinction here between, you know, knowledge and mere information. I think that it's much easier to produce the simulacra of knowledge than the substance of knowledge. So it's much easier to either speak. I mean, I think that a lot of the minds that produce knowledge are very unusual people and they look very weird and we tend to not want to attribute the breakthroughs to them. So a lot of the people we favor as experts are often popularizers. 
like this, I would take this really far. I would even go as far as to say, well, it's not completely clear on the onset whether say, you know, Albert Einstein's contributions are great or whether he's adding like a small little thing after the work of a bunch of other physicists that are well less well known and that weren't running like important, you know, weren't running a whole media campaign on the side in addition to their physics work. Or the classic example um, of, uh, you know, Darwin had many advocates back in the day championing his claim. Had he not had those advocates, maybe a different British gentleman would have gotten, you know, credit for the relevant ideas. But then not just ideas here, competencies, right? I think we are as a society constantly almost, I'm not going to say gaslit, but fooled, where we assume that uh, a particular ability goes together necessarily with a different ability. And as soon as this assumption is unquestioned and goes throughout all of society, uh, the two start to diverge notably. Because when you start off, no one is optimizing just for one in order to show the other. But over time, more and more people show off one. And eventually, the people who are best at showing off one have none of the second at all. So I think we're, we're deeply confused about the origin of knowledge. And I think we're deeply confused about uh, who's internalized or produced knowledge. And I think the actual number of scientists in the world is about 2,000 scientists rather than 2 million scientists. As, our, you know, as on paper, we claim that there are 2 million scientists. I think they're more like 2,000 scientists in the full sense of the word that the term scientist carried in the 19th century. So that's a, I think that's rare to believe, at least in that extreme aversion. I, I will, I will just add one note, which is when you, since you mentioned Einstein and you were implying something about atomic bomb and atomic energy after world war II, there was in fact a struggle in the United States, in the halls of Congress and in the, among the people to figure out who is going to be in charge of funding basic research and, and who is going to be in control of the development of atomic energy. So the civilian AEC resulted but I am a bit of a scholar of this area and the, uh, the people who didn't want civilian control attributed almost all of the success to the astonishing coordination of private and governmental stuff in secret to build plants of sorts that had never been built. It was all about the corporate military alliance and the tremendous and reliable accomplishment of one of the greatest bureaucrats in the history of the United States. Leslie Groves, the general who built the Pentagon and then was in charge of the whole program. Um, so th that was a case where the, the credit was contested and the garlic breath, mostly Jewish foreigner accented eggheads who had worked on blackboards in the desert uh, really uh, didn't get as much attention as they've now gotten excessive attention from historians who were like them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, historians, there, there's a joke I once heard that, you know, history, uh, history is first written by the loser, then it's written by the victim, uh, by the victor, right? Because the loser often has a reason to try to recast their, their t version of the story as the correct one, right? Which is why, for example, like, you know, the amount of writing on the Civil War in 1870 by Southerners versus Northerners is an interesting test. Would the Southerners spill almost infinite amounts of ink to try to make, you know, to try to turn the thing upside down from how it actually happened? Yeah. And, and they, then only they, later they do you get the counter-revisionary literature. Yeah. Well, they won Reconstruction. South won Reconstruction. Yeah. Well, thank you. It's a fascinating period. A lot of people don't even know that immediately after World War II, the vast majority of nuclear weapons were under control of the department, you know, the predecessor to what today is the Department of Energy. I think it was the Amer Atomic Energy Commission, right? That was the name of it, rather yes. than uh, under the control of the Air Force. And it was actually a fairly controversial move to move all the nukes from uh, this committee to the Air Force, because the Air Force obviously wanted to use them, not only wanted to have authority no, over no, using no, no, them. No, 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 the dominant, okay, so we're going get, to get in the weeds, but what you it's said- to get in the weeds, like, yeah. Close enough to being right, because the Air Force was never really in charge. It was so it was much not, inter yeah. rivalry that there was no way the newest branch, the little baby branch of the Air Force was going to be in charge of this. So one of the first tests was the value at sea the Bikini Atoll experiment, right? So the Navy got a piece of the action, the Army the got a piece of the action. The Navy was very powerful at the, the time. Army, to this day, we have the, the, the three-legged strategic triad 
Um, the strategic triad is there to, to give each of them a stake rather than because it's necessary. That would be one cynical perspective about the uh, importance of inter-service rivalry in the post-war period in the US. Yeah. Well, th um, thank, thank you very I, I much, David. I'm gonna... Atomic history, but I, I, had to, I had to let that, I had to, had to mention that. Oh, I'd love to read more about it. If you, if you drop any links or something, I'd love to read more about that. It's a beautiful, interesting area of history, but Rhodes's book is a good place to start. Rhodes's book. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the next question, let me see in the chat who's next. Um, Yaya, am I pronouncing that right? It's actually going to be me, Samo. I'm going to jump Oh, it's in. you, Sean? Okay, yeah. great. <laughs> All right. Um, I just had a quick, well, I was hoping that you could discuss the principal agent problem and incentive structures for effective bureaucracies. And also a second uh, question as well about uh, skin in the game for journalists and a way of doing that that would affect it, that uh, would avoid the obvious uh, conflicts of interest. Yeah, those are just very, very difficult questions. For regard to bureaucrats, often the best way to have um, someone that's undertaking a project be, you know, actually interested in completing the project as a reputational incentive rather than a financial incentive. Um, there are a lot of people whose names are tied to particular projects in such a way that if the project that they championed, that they managed fails, uh, they themselves are often then considered a failure. Um, Sergei Korolev uh, managed to achieve this in the Soviet space system, despite the financial and other incentives of the system being absolutely terrible, but built up a personal reputation with particular party members and then banked on every success of the Soviet space program during his lifetime and during his career as further evidence that this was working. There's more than a passing similarity between Korolev's approach and Elon Musk's approach, even though the financial logistics of the two are very different, right? Um, I think the personal stake, the widely known personal stake is very important. Uh, and I think it motivates people in a very strong way, right? I think almost a stronger way than pure financial incentive. There are many people who are motivated primarily by pure financial incentive, and you can do interesting things there. Um, I think that Singapore's approach of buying, uh, of paying public service officials, uh, pu public service members and you know, members of government and so on, rates that are comparable to the private sector is a good way for them to retain the best talent Singapore can possibly retain. Um, but I think, because I think it would be difficult to have someone be as inspired by Singapore as someone might be inspired by the ideals of the United States. No matter how great Singapore is, it's just a city. It's not this, you know, implicitly not this big venture to change the world as such. So because it's not, because it's just a city, the best way to do it is to pay competitive prices. So people prefer to work on Singapore rather than go to New York and work at a finance company of some kind. So hopefully that's uh, relevant to your question. It's not a straightforward solution, but it's sort of like, well, if you can tie it to their personal reputation on some grand project that you know their whole life either fails or succeeds on, failing that compensate them really, really well. Okay, uh, I don't have a sense of who's next in line. So I think Christy, Christy had a question. Well, um, now I have a series of questions. Um, first of all, I wanted to um, point out something you were talking about um, uh, regarding uh, competency and identifying competency. There's actually some Nobel laureate work that's been done on that. Um, I don't remember the names of the three economists who did that, but the book comes to mind, The Market for Lemons, mm -hmm. and it talks about how we use signifiers. I was researching it for some privacy project I was working on, but we use signifiers, and like you were talking about the tests, um, there's, there's a lot of work, and it's a very robust field of economics as to why America, meritocracies don't work. So anyway, tying that back and popping the stack a bit, um, I'm thinking about um, the, uh, is it too soon to really analyze what happened in China with the notification? Because I see a lot of people denigrating China for being very authoritarian and 
clamping down on what doctors reported. And I'm not seeing that is all that different from what's happening to my friends in the Midwest who are being sent home without testing, without any official reporting with COVID system symptoms. Um, and so I kind of get the sense that there's an institutional bias against reporting as you already discussed. Um, do you see the, the Chinese situation as being uh, significant there? Well, I think everyone, uh, all governments around the world try to scapegoat in all directions that they can, right? And the US calling it a Chinese virus is accurate, but politically motivated. And in China spreading weird conspiracy theories that the virus actually originated in the US and was brought during the, um, I think it was military sports games or something like this. There was a particular event not too far from Wuhan. Uh, that's politically useful because people tend to believe the conspiracy theories there. Um, so I think that the reporting significantly disconnected from reality. I think that it is important to hold one's own institutions to a high standard of constructive criticism, higher than foreign governments, because I'll be frank, most Americans don't know how China works. It's really, really hard to figure out how China works. Most China pundits do not know how China works. And it's actually this you know, whole universe onto itself. So I take any claims about China and how the government handled there very, very lightly. I just hold them very lightly and I stick more to, if I can, uh, looking how the response fails here. Again, as I said, it's much easier to evaluate the failures of already inactive systems because no one really has an incentive to try to deceive you about them after they're long gone. Yeah, I hope that hits uh, the core of your question. I wanna make sure I do answer it. Cool, um, maybe the next question. Okay. We, we have a few more, hey guys, we have a few more questions, um, I think all lined up, uh, actually a lot, and I think just a lot more are coming in. Um, so, uh, it is now almost uh, 7 p.m. PT. I don't want to be mindful of your time, Samo. Um, I, don't I know have about you have to run off 20 to. minutes more if that's, if we want, wish to continue. And if you want to wrap up, that's also fine. No, well, I can keep this going. Um, let's see how long, I, how long I can stay before I drop off, uh, off miraculously. But in that case, I feel like you've got something good going on here and they're mostly intruding. So, um, uh, well, I think next one up, we had Mia, I think, who had a question, and then uh, we had a few other folks queued. So feel free to just, uh, you know, uh, raise your hand again and then uh, and, and then uh, jump in. I think Mia or, or Jaja and, and Mia were next, if I'm correct. Please. Mia, you are muted in case you want, you're asking a question. Hello. I just unmuted you. Yeah. No, this has been great. Thanks so much. And and um, yeah, I was curious that the the way I framed the question. Uh, I, I recently interviewed somebody from um, the UN called Lambert Hogenhout, and he talked about um, you know what the UN's doing with SDGs as 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 a way to kind of like really do a major coordination of you know post COVID and you know, just, just, you know, not back to normal, you know, things not going back to normal. And I was just curious, your point of view about, um, you know, how, how things are going to just land um, in, in the world, you know, so he, he was talking about just, just bringing it all together from global health, from global, you know, poverty, everything, education, women. And, and I, I just thought, you know, um, this, this salon is, is an excellent place to, you know, just find out what, what kind of bureaucracy do you think, you know, will, will allow for a post COVID world to sort of, you know, um, happen. I don't know if that makes sense. Does that make sense? Um, I think it makes some sense. Um, okay. well, it's, it's always very hard to, because these are very big topics, but mm -hmm. I think that it is the case that, uh, I think there will be Thank structural you. structural changes to how we live. And I think that's been the case with any public health 
uh, improvement that's happened over the last 200 years. Um, the very fact that, you know, washing your hands is a reminder rather than an innovation shows how much our culture has changed under pressure. When washing your hands was first proposed, it was mocked as impractical by doctors in the 19th century, let alone something that the general public should just do during flu season. Uh, so I expect our cultural norms will shift one or two steps more towards sanitary public behavior and possibly one or two steps more socially distant. I think that will be a permanent shift somewhat. But I also think that uh, economically, there will be a move towards more robustness and redundancy as national policy, which will, as a side effect, also produce some economic inefficiencies. So I expect one or two clicks back on globalization, but not an undoing, not an undoing of globalization. Um, I could talk more, but then I think the changes after this become more speculative, right? Like, you know, uh, I don't think there'll be a new international institution set up. Uh, I do not think the WHO will undergo reform. Um, I do not think that the US will be significantly reorganized. Um, I do think uh, office politics, uh, office culture is going to change significantly. I think major American companies are probably going to permanently shift how they uh, deploy their labor force. I think China will attempt to do this, but in practice, their companies are just going to do whatever is most efficient. And they don't actually have that much control as to what happens on the factory floor. It's very interesting. People often think of China as like, it is hyper authoritarian in some ways, but the ability of the Chinese government to manage what happens on a factory floor in a Chinese factory might in fact be lower than say the ability of a Western government to do the same. In other words, a lot of the regulations the Communist Party earnestly tries to implement are just unimplementable because mm. of corruption on the ground. But, but it's interesting because um, if you look at Greece as an example mm -hmm. and, and Australia to some extent, um, you know, they, they've managed to sort of, you know, adopt some of the lessons from South you know, Korea and Singapore, as you've already mentioned. And, you know, I, I, I'm just, you know, wondering what, what adoption is going to look like, what testing is going to look like. Are we all just waiting for a vaccine? You know, is this, is this the big kind of moment we're waiting it for? Won't be, it won't be sustainable to wait for a vaccine. Though right. if the vaccine, vaccine happens out, it's like, mm -hmm. you know, if it, if it comes quickly, I'll be very positively surprised. I don't know enough about the development cycles of vaccines. Mm -hmm. I know Bill Gates has sponsored a bunch of work in it. I know a bunch of labs are working on them. Um, I think there's a huge economic incentive, but you know, even waiting for six months, right? It's too long. There's gonna be some intermediate solution that's gonna come before that and some reopening of the economy and society. Mm. So a, vac a vaccine may take a very long time. I mean, AIDS is a very different disease with some subtleties. Mm -hmm. It's been 35 years and Fauci and company have been in charge of the effort and there's been no AIDS vaccine. There's an argument I've heard from some experts that these types of, that like the, the COVID virus is a much easier one than, than say AIDS, right? But that, again, maybe it's not that's my domain. true, but, but this idea that it's going to take 12 to 18 months, that would be nice. Well, let's not, let's not count on it. We, we certainly can't wait even six months is what I would say. So I actually ex expect um, there'll be some behavior changes with depending on the biology of the virus might actually improve public health or might be more, uh, let's call it, uh, let's call it public health theater, right? Where after 9-11, there was a big giant demand to have this never happen again. And now we all have slightly more inconvenient flights. So I could imagine easily that we will roll out a bunch of changes to everyday life and we'll be told to go back to work and go back in the streets. And in fact, a bunch of people will die, but there'll be an argument that, the, that we're doing the best we can and that the changes we're undertaking are the best that can be done. So there's a, the, the worst outcome is public health theater and the best outcome is we do find some measures short of a vaccine that allow us to you know, restart restart physical, not just digital society in three to six months. Now, everyone here, almost everyone in this chat is already extremely privileged because we're part of this tiny part of the digital economy. Most of us get to work from home. Um, most of my neighbors, I live in the Eastern Mission, like they don't get to work from home. 
a lot of them are losing their jobs right now. Those 20 million jobs in the US are in fact going away and UBI will not come in. Uh, it won't come in to rescue people and uh, society as was previously structured, however horribly flawed or however you know, well-built, you know, there's some ways in which it's horribly flawed and other ways in which it's exceptionally brilliantly built will continue. I mean, part of my, my point was about Chernobyl was, you know, even after everyone tried up to the willingness to sacrifice your own life to try to make this disaster work out well, at the end of the day, they still used the same structure that they had available before. It's just that they couldn't feel quite as good about the structure afterwards, right? Um, well, was, wait a minute, wait a minute. Didn't the structure fall apart afterwards, actually? Didn't not immediately. Suffer? No, but I mean, Chernobyl arguably had a big effect on the collapse of the Soviet Union. Yes, but during the process, mitigate the mitigation of the disaster, Sure, they were sure. using the same structure. And I think the lag between the collapse is like eight to nine years. So their belief in the system certainly was reduced and it proved to everyone that was much less functional than claimed. And the Soviet government did try to play it down and mostly failed to play it down. Partially because everyone was personally affected. People were told, you know, you can't go pick berries in the forest anymore or you, you shouldn't eat lettuce this week because, uh, you know, it's, it's contaminated. So those kind of things, they're very, they're memorable, right? It's the sort of like, well, masks don't help and store masks for the doctors, right? It's that sort of, it's very memorable and sticks with people. Um, I wouldn't expect any macro change immediately. I think if the biology of the virus is such that some health measures short of a vaccine help, then we will undertake those health measures. And if the reality is that those measures don't help, we will undertake some measures and the official story will be that this is, you know, helping and that, you know, we in fact have dealt somewhat with the virus and it was beyond human ability to do anything about it anyway. So like, let's remember this pandemic, it's not the end of the world. This is just a normal plague. Like in fact, in a 18th century or 16th century plague, far more people would die. And the system was in some ways much less sophisticated and, uh, you know, people went about, went about their daily life. Yeah, this and, is nothing compared to smallpox. Yeah, yeah. In a way, perhaps the All fact right. that this is such a great event is, shows background unnoticeable progress, right? Our standards are rising faster than our capacity, right? So possibly that's, uh, that's a reason for optimism. Yeah, and attention spans, I think, are peaking and are very spiky, but they're short. You know, it's hard to remember the, uh, the, the last events. I think, I don't remember who said that, but like, um, never make the mistakes uh, of repeating history uh, to, uh, to new folks. You know, it's like, it's, it's insane that people forget very quickly. Um, okay, uh, I think next one up, we had uh, Jaja. I don't know if your question's still relevant. Uh, you had a question right at the beginning, and I just want to make sure that in case you're still here and want to ask it, uh, yeah. Uh, just yours. Yeah, I, I'm just very uh, interested and hope uh, hope Samuel to elaborate a little bit more on, um, um, like how, like, what are the methods that you use to um, understand institutional um, incentives, um, and how do you research differently on institution? Um, that are uh, functioning right now uh, and institution that was um, that has no longer like Rome, Roman Empire or, or um, similar like old institution. Yeah, with research methods, often there's no there's no way to skip. Uh, try to find and read everything publicly stated by the organization. Uh, number two, try to find any sources that show. Um, you know, any sort of leaked information over time, such as emails or whatever, or stuff that was reported by journalists. Um, number three, interview current employees and people who are working at the organization, asking them questions. Um, number four, you know, go find the dissatisfied former employees and expect that they are, their perspective is skewed, but if you mine their perspective for insights, you will find genuine insights from them that you wouldn't hear from anyone else. So they might be dissatisfied, you know, they might be dissatisfied for completely trivial reasons, but they'll bring about, they'll bring up real flaws with their former organization. Um, and then also, you know, ideally, 
talk about, you know, so the, the interviews, the scouring of any material released by the organization, the scouring of any internal documents you might find, and in particular, keep an eye out for internal company communiques and communication, uh, whether it's a company or a bureaucracy, uh, it's very good to keep track of whether a document is produced in order to fulfill a process or whether a document is primarily produced because someone is trying to communicate to solve a problem. Uh, the difference can be subtle, but after you've poured through like, you know, a lot of forms, you very quickly come to realize which form is there because someone wanted to fill out a form and which, uh, which message is there because someone, someone wanted to institute a change to the organization. So this would be a contemporary current organization. Some of these methods are also usable for organizations for say 50 or 60 or 70 years ago. Um, for stuff that's older and more ancient, that's more to ground historical understanding and awareness. So uh, you undertake ideally a case study and you again uh, just go into the archives and try to read the personal letters. So if you study the East India, you know, East India Company, the way to do it would be to just go read as many of their documents as you can, or the translations of as many of their documents as you can, or read as many of the personal correspondences between the people and try to reconstruct what's actually going on. It's, you know, very primitive, it's very time consuming, but it's often the best way, right? There are ways in which human motivations when you look at someone up close, they shine through. And also there are matters of fact where, you know, you kind of like interrogate the text as it goes sequentially and they can be wrong, they can be lying. Um, but, you know, they said this on that day and they said this other thing this other day. And you do a little, not quite Sherlock Holmes game of, of inference, but you do some inference on it. Uh, it's The search is constrained notably by just general organizational theories. Much like with geology, you don't ever start digging in a random place in the Earth's crust. You basically have a theory of what's happening and then you go dig in specific places and either the theory is confirmed or it's not confirmed. Sometimes ideally you find ways to contradict it as well. So you do a lot of retro predictions, right? So predictions not about the future, but predictions about if I go look at this part of the world, this is what I will find. And then either being surprised or not. Thank you. Cool. Um, Alison, what's the next question? Uh, well, David had another one and then we had uh, Ash Milton with uh, a long comment. Maybe you can make it into a question. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll make mine a, a question, which is I'm wondering whether you're using the term bureaucracy just the way Max Weber used it as a organization devoted to, fig to implementing formal, legal, clear, reasonably principled uh, ideas about policy and process. And, and the reason I'm asking is because I think so much of the problems in the United States at the top of the government, mm -hmm. are because we actually have a court system, which relies on personal favor, personal loyalty, and, you know, almost a calculated deliberate lack of process in order to keep different court advisors and players on their toes, maximizing their alignment to the king rather than anybody else. And the emphasis on personal loyalty, you know, can coexist with, with bureaucracy, but it seems very strong and distinctive here and specifically relevant to COVID-19 because they just kind of blow off evidence and rely on theater, scam, propaganda, charlatanry and, and wish, wish magical thinking, which seem to coexist more easily with courts than bureaucracies. Yes, um, there's overlap with the definition Weber uses. Um, Weber, by the way, is just for everyone who's listening very much, I recommend reading his works, um, but it's not quite the same. I dropped a link to uh, a piece titled How to Use Bureaucracies um, that I've wrote, that I've written. Um, I would say that I use bureaucracies to mean more these automated systems, right, which can be legalistic in nature, or they can be, say, um, customary in nature. So the difference here would be the, I don't propose that the legitimacy of a bureaucracy necessarily rests in the foundations Weber would identify with modern bureaucratic processes. If I were, say, studying, um, you know, the ancient Egyptian priesthood of Amun, 
or the Catholic Church in the 8th century, I might just casually refer to them as bureaucracies as well, because what's happening there is people following rules, uh, using uh, written tokens to determine what their next action is, primarily doing symbol manipulation. But the basis of legitimacy then would be some sort of religious, sacral, otherworldly stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, it might ne never make an appeal to reason explicitly. It might simply make an appeal to precedence. Uh, but a lot of the functional organizational dynamics would be very similar. So I think that there is a difference. Catholic priesthood implementing theological innovation and knowledge in a bureaucratic framework in the way that you're using bureaucracy. Okay. Got I mean, it. they often did, right? Not always. Sometimes it broke down. And certainly, you know, the favoritism at the top and the relevant stuff, that's all pointed out by Martin Luther. So there's a similarity there. Great. Okay, so um, Alison, do we have a final question, perhaps? Yes, we do have a final question. Uh, and that final question goes to Ivan. <laughs> Yay. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Ivan. Hi, hi Sama. Um, yeah, so question, you've repeatedly said that like the real, the only real way to study bureaucracies is to read their documentation or read private correspondence with or interview bureaucracy. or interview the people that work there. Interview the people there. Um, is there an example, like a book you could point us to of a master of what you consider like a world class study of a bureaucracy using of the original documents that we would use that we could use as an example, if you wanted to learn to study i.e. Samo, when is your book coming out? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been I've been kept busy, right? People yes, that's people what I keep meant. people keep wanting to, to to hire me lately. I don't know why. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, there is I think no straightforward guide. There are many excellent historians who do this in particular domains. There are some 20th century uh thinkers and writers that did a good job of studying say the air force bureaucracy or even advising it and uh there's some people like uh taylor and so on from the start of the 20th century that invented what's called um i think it was called efficiency consulting at the time uh they did a decent job of just showing up as anthropologists in workplaces observing and then rationalizing or optimizing the processes in various ways uh, I think that's, you know, that's interesting. I also think that there was a real and sustained effort, and this is perhaps like slightly more controversial, but hopefully not too controversial. There was a sustained effort by British anthropologists to understand the functioning of cultures in the British Empire and study them. Uh, so I would actually say that, you know, British anthropologists from 1930 or 1940 whenever they say that this or that is happening in a Middle Eastern kingdom or uh, a part of India, they're probably correct, right? And I would look at their writing for how to figure out what to do in an organization of that type. And I would say that they're probably correct um, because the British were very, very good at manipulating outcomes in those domains, right? Lawrence of Arabia, like we should remember, he's not just like this random idealistic adventurer. He's literally, you know, a one man weapon system sent to the Ottoman Empire to cause an Arab uprising, successfully, I might add, right? So that's, you know, the proof's there in the pudding, right? These people shifted the outcomes massively. I also think the autobiographies of some statesmen might be useful but it's gonna be the more humble type rather than the charismatic type, the one that got things done, whether or not it was attributed to them or to someone else, because the challenges of such a person when they're navigating the government are very similar to the challenges an, out an outside researcher might have when they try to study it. It turns out that just because you sit in an office called say the Oval Office, if we're being again charismatic instead of humble, doesn't mean you're actually any better at understanding what these bureaucracies are doing you're still doing this massive, you're massively information overwhelmed. Uh, you have to pick and choose, you have to pursue hypotheses, and you can't really take people's word for it. Okay, I hope that, that Anna manages to at least answer part of your question. It's a difficult question. Maybe I'll write up a list of books I would recommend from historians, management uh, people, statesmen, and anthropologists, and then I'll drop that link later. I would love that. Thank you so much. Okay. Great, great. Uh, I really want to thank right. this audience. It's been great. I love especially the people who push back against points or ask questions or added new sources. I love that.
It's like, I learned that way. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I think one of the real benefits of doing this every day and I've having actually a lot of people, a lot of you guys attend, you know, almost on a daily basis. Some of you really on a daily basis, which, which I really love uh, is that, you know, we get quite comfortable with each other and it's like, it's really like more like a two way conversation. Uh, it's, it's been like really, really, really nice to watch. I think like, you know, with every day I want to do less and less. I think this was a particularly fruitful one uh, with lots of, with lots of really good points. Um, and, you know, somehow I think you gave a lot of really good pointers there. Um, I would um, perhaps like uh, encourage you to send me anything um, that I should add to the sanity schedule in terms of links where people can follow up. Um, you know, I mean, your own website, you know, maybe Medium, then, um, you know, a few other links that, uh, that, that would be helpful for folks. And then, um, yeah, I'm hoping, uh, you know, to have you on again. I think we have Ben uh, Landau. Um, who's I think in this chat uh, and uh, also Bismarck affiliated uh, on on um, when is it on Friday I think so that's uh, there's another interesting one upcoming and then we have Anthony Aguirre from Metaculus tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Um, uh, PT 6 p.m. for uh, for folks in Europe um, and he's going to talk about uh, Metaculus predictions especially on pandemics but also uh, beyond that and so I think you know this is a really nice uh, practical way of trying to, uh, you know, come up with better uh, sense-making systems um, and, you know, whether or not they can actually be impl uh, implemented and, and deployed is something that I think Robin has been ha hand-wringingly trying to work on with future keys. So let's see how, how actionable it is in terms of reforming our action institutions. But, uh, uh, but it's, uh, I think it's, uh, it's still really useful for, uh, for sense-making even outside of those. For now, uh, Samuel, thank you so, so much for this fantastic, uh, fantastic um, tour uh, through uh, using history and making sense of, uh, of the current world and being better able to equip the future. So it, it was really fantastic to have you here. Thank you, everyone. Uh, the chat has been uh, blossoming today. And uh, yeah, I'll try to get the video up by tomorrow morning, if we're lucky. And I hope to see many of you tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. again. And Samuel, I hope to have you on very, very soon. Thank you so much for making time and staying longer. Thank you so much, Alison, for hosting this and organizing this. It, thank you for, you know, putting me in touch with this great crew. Bye. Great. Okay. Bye-bye, everyone. I'll post a few more links on how to stay in touch about the salons in the chat. And, um, yeah, I hope you have a lovely evening. Okay, copy them quickly because I'm going to close the window now. Bye-bye.